service. I'm really excited um, tonight because I'm going to share a message about hope because I think hope is important. I think we live in a world that needs some hope. Let me just ask this. How many of you have been through some difficult things? All right. If you didn't know who I was, I am the recoveries pastor here at the church. So I lead the group. I lead the group on Friday nights who stands up and tells each other what their problem is. All right. I lead the group on Friday nights that, that, that admits they have some junk. So I'm going to ask you tonight, by a show of hands, how many of you have been through some difficult things in your life? You see, honesty is important. By a show of hands, how many of you would say, I'm going through some difficult things in my life? Honesty is important. Four years ago, I was in one of the most difficult times in my life, probably the hardest time of my life. Father's Day 2018, when I was arrested for a DWI and resigned from my church. And um, I, I ended up at Freedom. I always ask Pastor Kendall, Pastor Kendall, is this, what, is this just who I am? Is this what I'm going to lead with every time? And he said, you know, someday you'll know when not to lead with it. I'm not there yet. I'm still leading with it. All right. Because it is what God has done in my life. And when I sing about the living hope and I sing about how worthy he is, I I am reminded. I'm also reminded because it's almost four years for me. It's been an incredible journey. But my story is not just a reminder of the difficult things. It's also a reminder of how I made it through the hardest time in my life. And it's not just my story because I believe it's my story to help other people through some of the hardest things in their life. So I'm going to ask, I'm going to just share with you tonight, really openly and really honestly, how four years ago I made it through the hardest part, one of the hardest paths, one of the hardest times of my life. You want to know how I did it? On two wheels. That's how I did it. I did it on two wheels. I began several years ago to ride a bike when we first moved to, to Flower Mound. There was a bike trail near us and I began to ride a bike Uh, We went to Academy and I bought a $120 bike and we went out to the trails and and that bike lasted a big guy like me about six times out. Thanks, Ricky. And uh, so I'm going to share with you tonight how I got through some of the hardest times in my life. And the truth is it was on two wheels. It was some exercise. It was some hobby. It was some things to do. Really what it was for me, though, as I look back, it was church in the dirt. I went to church in the dirt. I was in the hardest place in my life, and I found God in the dirt, on the trails, on two wheels, and he changed my life. And so tonight, I'm going to just take you to church in the dirt, if that's all right. If I was to say, how many of you remember mountain bikes or biking when you were younger? When I first started biking, I got on it, hadn't rode a bike in years. I got on the trails, and I was like, why did I ever quit riding a bike? Man, this is a blast. How many of you remember riding bikes when you were little, right? If I was to say something like Schwinn, how many of you would bring back some memories instantly? Yeah, some Schwinners. How about Huffy? Any Huffy riders in the place? How many of you, here, here we're going way back. How many of you remember banana seats? Yeah. I had a green bike with a green banana seat, and it was, it was called the Sweet Pea. Did anybody else have a Sweet Pea bike? It had Sweet Pea on the seat. And I love riding bike when I was a kid. And they always say things about bike riding like um, it's one of those things you never forget, right? Just like riding a bike, you never forget it. <laughs> you know, forgetting how to ride a bike is not the hard part. Learning how to ride a bike is the hard part. You know what the hardest part about learning how to ride a bike is? The pavement. <laughs> the pavement's the hardest part about learning how to ride a bike. You know what's even harder than that? Teaching your kids how to ride a bike. That was one of the most trying things I did is if I required patience. I'll be honest, it was also before I rode bikes and wasn't quite, I'm not in great shape, but at least I'm riding bikes now, I'm doing something. Listen, riding behind your kids when they take the training wheels off is a workout. I mean, I'm like, oh God, I wish you'd just, don't do it today, all right? I'm about to die right here. Trying to teach my kid how to ride a bike. But I love, honestly, riding bikes. I spend a lot of time riding bikes now. This is my favorite bike, actually. Um, I had to put a little air in the tires today. It took me about twice as long. I think it's the inflation uh, rising, to, something to do with that. But <laughs> This is my favorite. Some of you get it. 
This is my favorite bike. You know why? Because this is a full suspension bike. This is for old people. Let's just be honest. This is easy on the body. It's got air shocks up front. It's got full suspension air shocks on the back. It's got a dropper seat post. Check that out. When you want to get on, when you want to get off, you just push the button. This is one of my favorite bikes. And the reason is it's because I continue to learn about God when I get alone with God. When I find time with God, you can ask my wife, what do I do to, to relieve stress? I get on my bike. I find a place to go to get with God. Something else that helped me four years ago was Celebrate Recovery, and I'm honored to be able to lead that here at Freedom Church. And tonight, tonight, I'm simply going to give you one of our lessons from our Celebrate Recovery program. If we can't get you there on Friday nights, we're going to bring it to you because we believe everybody needs it. Interestingly enough, tonight, we're going to share our lesson from Celebrate Recovery on hope. Heavenly Father, tonight, I thank you, God, for your goodness. I thank you for your, your, your word. I thank you tonight for your living hope. And I just pray, God, as we take a moment tonight in your word, that we're reminded, God, that there's nothing impossible for you, nothing too great for you. Bring hope to us tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And celebrate recovery. We have principles. And principle two is the hope principle. And it says this, that we earnestly believe that God exists, that I matter to him, and that he has the power to help me recover. The Bible says, happy are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Step two, which is principles two, principle two step says this. We came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us. Philippians tells us, for it is God who works in you to will, to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. You see, in principle two in our recovery program, but I believe in life, we begin to earnestly believe that God is real. That he's real to us. We begin to not only believe that he's real, but, but to believe that, that we matter. You see, it's not enough just to believe in God. We also have to know that God believes in me. If I believed in a God who didn't believe in me, what good would that God be? If, that, if I believed in a God who couldn't help me, what would we? In principle too, we begin to believe not only in God, but that I matter to God and that he wants to help my life. He wants to change my life. He wants restoration. He wants recovery. Hebrews eleven six tells us that anyone who comes to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. So at this point, we're beginning to seek God. Psalm 62, 5 says, yes, my soul finds rest in God. My hope comes from him. I want to take you back one step because in principle one, we had to do something before we could get here. In principle one, we had to admit we were powerless. Powerless over our addictions, powerless over our our hurts, our emotions, powerless over our our circumstances, powerless over what someone else may have done to us. We had to admit that it was out of our hands. And when we could admit that it was no longer in our ability to change, you see, as long as you're doing it, God can't. As long as you got your hands in it, there's no room for his. But when I say, God, I can't, guess what he says? You know how long I've been waiting for you to say that? For some of you tonight, God's just waiting for you to let him. Let him in. Let him have it. Let him do it. When you admit you're powerless, God can begin to help us to change our situations, to change our struggles. And then in the second principle, now we can believe God exists. Now we can believe we're important to him. Now we can believe he helps us. He has the help, the power to help us overcome. Four years ago, when I was at my lowest point, I'm being honest, I was hopeless. I had no hope. And and, and hope, as much as I knew what it meant and I knew the definition of it, it was a it was a foreign thought for me. Anybody else, by show of hands, ever been hopeless? Certainly. We know what it's like to to fear the unknown. We know what it's like to face the uncertainty. We know what it's like to think there's no change coming. There's no help coming. There's no hope coming. Tonight, I want to share with you from Celebrate Recovery what hope stands for. In CR, we have a lot of acronyms. We use a lot of acronyms. CR itself, right? Celebrate Recovery. We use a lot of acronyms and hope is an acronym tonight. And so I'm going to share with you what hope stands for. The H in the letter hope tonight, and if you remember these things, I believe it will give you hope 
in those difficult times. It'll help you trek the most difficult paths of your life. The letter H stands for higher power. We believe that Jesus Christ is the one and only higher power. We believe he's the only one who can bring hope to us. He's the only one who, by which we must be saved. It is Jesus Christ. The truth is tonight that you may believe in Jesus in your past. You may have believed in him. You may believe that he exists. You may even attend church. But principle two is not about religion. Principle two is about relationship. It's about a personal relationship with Christ. Principle two tells us that Jesus wants to be hands on day to day, moment by moment, involved in our lives with a relationship with him. He is our higher power. And we recognize that in principle two, we begin to believe that he can do for us what we have not been able to do for ourselves. Romans chapter 11, verse 36 in the Living Bible says that everything comes from God alone. Everything lives by his power. I believe this. Too many people today believe their doubts and doubt their beliefs. Too many of us today, let me say that again, believe our doubts and doubt our beliefs. I didn't bring just one bike with you tonight because, well, I just brought all the bikes, all right? Because for me, each bike has a different meaning and maybe even a different purpose. And this in itself is a completely different kind of bike. When we're talking about hope, when we're talking about the higher power and what he wants to do in our lives, we have to remember that sometimes the path we're on is a different kind of journey. This would be considered a road bike. It's made for a completely different purpose than this right here. It's lightweight. You know what this is made for? It's made for the long haul. That's what it's made for. And you see, in, the, in faith in Jesus Christ, the truth is sometimes we have to be in it for the long haul. Sometimes we have to commit to it. Now, I'm going to be honest. When I got back into biking, I, it was difficult. You know, I, the riding was easy. The riding very far was hard, right? And I'm by no, dis, no imagination of the mind a long-distance person, but the longest I've ever made it on this bike was, was 50 miles. That was a long way for me. But I'm going to just share with you what I had to go through to get there. It was a mind-over-matter thing. You see, this bike's made for jumping and fun and zipping through the trees and, you know, exciting stuff, right? Something new at every turn. Hikers you got to watch out for, Right? Deer crossing your path. I literally have video of deer running across me and almost hitting them. This bike's made for that, not this one. This one, you just get on and pedal. It, it, to be honest, it's boring. I have to make myself do this. I'd much rather get on this one and have fun. 50 miles on this was a work for me. How did I do it? I had to commit to doing it. I had to just get on and do the work. You see, the first four words in step two says we came to believe. What that does is it describes a process. You see, belief is not something we just have. Belief is the result of consideration, doubt, reasoning, finally conclusion. Belief is a process that we have to commit to. You know why so many people struggle with their belief? Why they believe one day and not the next? Why they have faith now and not when heartache comes? Because they're not in it for the long haul. They're not committed that no matter what, I'm finishing this. Second Corinthians 12 and nine says, my grace is enough for you. Where there is weakness, a power is shown more completely. This bike taught me on my journey and still does. I ride this bike when the mountain bike trails are closed, when it's raining. It taught me that sometimes I just got to get on and go. That though the road may be long and hard, I've just got to trust God. Got to trust my higher power. The O in hope stands for openness to change. I have to be willing to change. Four years ago, I was not open to change. I was not ready for change. It was a process too. Let's look at the first four words again. We came to believe. The first thing it says is we came. Yeah, that's the first step. That's maybe you, the first time you come to church or maybe it's the first time you came to the altar or maybe it's the first time you came to a, a recovery meeting. 
That's the first step. That's saying I'm open to change. I'm, I'm, I'm willing to let God show me something. And then it says we came to. We didn't just come, but we came to. This is when we stopped denying that we had hurts, that we had habits, that we had hangups. This is when we quit just coming to church and we began to come and allow God to move in us. We came to, right? And then the last part of it says we came to believe. Now we are not just here. Now we're not just involved, but we start seeing and believing and receiving God's power to help us change. Sometimes we're afraid to change and resist because fear of the unknown. Four years ago, I didn't know what it looked like to have a life without drinking. Four years ago, I didn't want to imagine a life that didn't have alcohol in it. Four years ago, I never thought I would be able to return to ministry. I couldn't even see that for me. Sometimes we can't see for ourselves. We're blinded by our emotions. We're blinded by our struggle. This is not my bike. This is my wife's bike. This is Sabrina's bike. You see, sometimes the hardest path you're on, you can't go alone. And when I couldn't see the change, and when four years ago I laid in my bed in the middle of the night and said, there's no hope, she could see a future I couldn't. When I couldn't see God forgiving me, she told me he would. When I couldn't see restoration, she said he will. When I never saw myself proclaiming the gospel again to the church, she said, I promise you it will happen. Sometimes the hardest path you're on, you just need a riding buddy. You need somebody who's going to come along beside you and and support you and be there with you. Not always easy. My wife almost broke her wrist last week riding with me. As soon as she recovers, she's going to get out there and go again. We all need people who are willing to take the bumps and bruises to help us see it through, to help us heal, to walk through us in this journey. Ephesians 4.23 says that now your attitudes and your thoughts must all be constantly changing for the better. You must be a new and different person. And four years ago when I couldn't be that person, when I couldn't see it, It was my wife who walked along beside me, who helped me see that person. One week later, when I was still laying in the darkness of our bedroom, depressed and desolate, it was my wife that said, get up, go ride your bike. You're going to die if you don't get out of this bed. Sometimes we need people to see what we can't see. How will we do that, though? How will we, how will we, once we can see and be open to the change, how will we receive it? The letter P stands for power to change. We have to believe that he gives us the power to change. In the past, we may have wanted to change, but we were unable to do so. Principle two says we understand that God's power can change us and our situation. This This is the monster truck of bikes. This is the fat tire, do anything, go anywhere bike. And four years ago, I wanted to get rid of it. Because yeah, you see, I didn't start riding bikes four years ago. I started riding on the mountain bike trails eight, nine years ago. And to be completely honest, this bike was kind of hurtful. Because this is the bike that I would ride And then after the ride, I would drink. I would hide away and and drink. And this this bike was tough because it reminded me of the person I was. It reminded me of the lies I had told. This bike, I'm going to be honest, I wanted to get rid of it. But this is the bike my wife said, get up, get out of this bed and go ride your bike. This is the bike that I began to ride a week later after my arrest in the middle of my depression. This is the bike that saved my life. This is the bike that I began to attend church in the dirt on. This is the bike that I would ride for hours and crank the worship music off and just just beg God to forgive me and to love me. This was the bike where God taught me about grace and forgiveness. This was the bike where I would I would I would just fall on my face in the dirt on those mountain bike trails. Sometimes I wrecked and ended up with my face in the dirt. And sometimes I would just lay down and cry and pray for God to do what I knew he could, for God to begin to change 
my life, for the power of God to begin to change my life. This is the bike where I begin to experience the power of change. Philippians 4.13 says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. The Living Bible says it this way, for I can do everything God asks me to do with the help of Christ who gives me the strength and power. You see, in principle two, we begin to understand that God's power can change us. It can change our situation. It can change our lives. And once we begin to see those changes, guess what happens? That power begins to have a a result. We begin to have right actions. We begin to have Christ-like actions. We begin to have Christ-like thinkings. Those things follow naturally the power of God. You see, too many of us want the change to come and then think the power will come. We want to, we want to, you know, a lot of people won't come to the altar because they think they have to change first so that they can then begin to experience the power. And God forgive us as pastors if we've led them to believe that because the power comes before the change. As a matter of fact, the change only comes after we have received power. Once we begin to experience the power of God, we begin to be open to it. Right actions and right thinking and Christ-like behavior happens naturally. Because that's a process of, Scripture says, the old man die and the new man being born again. The last letter in hope is E, and it stands for expect to change. Once we're open to change, we begin to, to believe it and see it and even begin to experience it. We, be the, we then have to begin to expect change. We have to expect God to do something different. We have to expect God to to show up and to to change our lives, to make a difference. Here's what I would say. Don't quit before the miracle happens. Sometimes we give up because we're not expecting God to come through. We give up because we lose faith. I'm, I'm as transparent as I can be. I say it on Friday nights. I'll say it to you tonight. I wanted to drink every day for at least a year. I came to this church and sit here and worshiped and cried and barely made it. Almost lost my faith, almost lost my family, almost lost everything. And all I wanted to do was drink. But I knew there was better. And I knew that if I kept surrendering, if I kept sacrificing, if I kept choosing God, if I kept choosing not to drink. If I kept doing what I needed to do. The change would happen. I was expecting it to happen. And it took a while, but it did. And it, and it began to happen. And then I began to see it happen. Philippians 1, 6 says, I'm sure that God who began the good work in you will keep you right on helping you grow in his grace until his task within you is finished on the day that Jesus returns. You know what that means? That you'll continually be changing. That until Christ returns, there's a process of change going on in your life. See, problem is sometimes we think I've changed enough. That's enough change, God. Yet God is continually wanting to change us. We are being made new. Scripture even says we are being saved. Hope is not something we just have. Hope is something we work for. We believe in. God delivers to us. We receive it. We act on it. We live it out. Hope is something we express. We share, we live by, and it helps us to live. That's what hope is. This isn't even my bike. This is my friend Cliff's bike. And since he left it in my garage, I told him I was going to use it as a sermon prop. Cliff, come here. He's been helping us all night. Come here, Cliff. If you guys don't know Cliff, this is Cliff Atkinson, one of my best friends. Give him a great big hand. Cliff's more than my bike assistant tonight. He's one of my best friends. He's also my accountability partner in our Celebrate Recovery program, and he's the guy who keeps me in line. You see, sometimes on our path to restoration, we need somebody to call us out. We need somebody to say, hey, where you been? How you been? You're not looking, you're not looking right, doing right. Cliff will call me out, trust me. We've had hard conversations. I mean, listen, if you, have a, if, if you don't dislike your best friend, he's not your best friend. <laughs> If you don't get mad at your best friend, he's not your best friend. If he doesn't call you out and make you better, Cliff rides with me. He's my riding buddy too. You know what he does for me on the trails? He challenges me. 
He pushes me. He sets the pace. He gives me goals. I don't know if it's just because he's younger or dumber, but he <laughs> maybe braver. That's a better word. Yeah. But Cliff pushes me. Whether I'm in the lead or he's in the lead. When I know there's more of us on the same trail, I'm going to keep going. The truth is, I'm the type of person that if it's just me, I'll take the easy road. I'll take the shortcut. I'll slow down, take a few water breaks. But if I know somebody else is behind me, let's go together. It's not easy either. I don't know if you see Cliff's knees. How are they, Cliff? Cliff's wiped out a few times the last few weeks. Being my friend on the trails isn't easy. Listen, here's what we need. We need people who will go along beside us in this life and challenge us. People that we want to be like. People that we want to follow. People that we want to lead. People who will push us to be better than we are. People who will call us out. People who bring hope out of us and to us. There's one more person I want to bring up tonight, and he's been helping me all night too. And Ricky is my friend. Come on up, Ricky. And the truth is, Ricky's a biker. (laughs) Way better biker than me. On some bikes. Um, But Ricky (laughs) has... Ricky has a Father's Day story, too. And tonight, I want to briefly let you guys uh, meet Ricky. And uh, I've never stood on any stage at any church and shared this. So I'm thankful that you gave me the opportunity to. Uh, I also have a Father's Day story that uh, involves the bike and how it landed me here at Freedom Church, where I am right now. On June 19th, 2016, on that day, it was Father's Day, I was struck by a vehicle and uh, I thought I was going to die. It was a pretty scary day. I uh, got a pretty significant amount of injuries and yeah, that's me before I got hit. (laughs) And um, it was a very frightening day. I I don't really talk about it too much, but um, I went to the hospital. They took me in on a stretcher. And uh, I shattered the windshield of a car. So half my body, left shoulder leading, uh, went through the windshield. And uh, I bled a lot. And I went to the hospital. I had kidney failure. I had a a broken scapula, some fractures in my vertebrae. And uh, I have a permanent injury on my left shoulder um, in terms of tissue loss. But I've made one tremendous recovery uh, by the grace of God. That is for sure. And and the best part? So... Ricky's a triathlete. He's been a biker for a long time. One prize after prize. And he had this life-changing event, which here's why I wanted to bring Ricky up tonight. My story was my fault. I landed myself in a place of hopelessness, hopelessness because of my choices. And I understand addiction. I'm, not into, I'm saying tonight I made a choice that got me there. When I heard Ricky's story, I'm reminded that sometimes the paths we're on are not our fault. Some of you who raised your hands earlier... Your situation is out of your control. But what I wanted you to hear with Ricky's story tonight is there is triumph over tragedy. Ricky's back on the bike. That's the most important thing. He's back on the bike. He rides mountain bikes with me now or he's starting. We're going to get him out there. Sometimes you just got to get back on. You know, you just got to get back on. The cool part about Ricky's story is that his life changed. He shared with me everything changed. His career changed. And, and through an incredible turn of events, Ricky ended up right here with us at Freedom Church. Yeah, it was pretty tremendous. So um, I went to school for exercise physiology, and um, I've always worked as a trainer. It's all I've ever done. It's all I know how to do. It's what I love to do. I feel it's something that God called me to do. And um, at the time, I was doing very well in my company. And I was the top producer in the company that I worked for. And as a result of that, it's very difficult if you ever want to leave that club because your whole business is there and you work a lot of hours. And um, in that case, it's very difficult to leave. And I wanted to leave. Um, I wanted to leave. I didn't want to live in Miami anymore at the time. And um, I really felt like somehow I just had to go. But being in the position that I was in, I couldn't. But on Father's Day... (laughs) when that car hit me and I worked seven days a week, you know, I I didn't go to church the way I I 
just didn't spend time there on Sundays. I didn't go. Um, Because I had to be number one, right? I wanted to be the best person in my company. And I got into this accident on that day. And it took me to the hospital and put me in the lowest point of my life. I tried to return back to work, but it was very, very difficult. I had tremendous injuries, obviously. And I was going through a lot of physical therapy. And uh, they moved me positions after about nine months. I was unable to produce the same way I could. And I became a membership advisor. And so I ended up basically selling memberships, training, and other services in my gym. But that's not what I wanted to do. It's not where I wanted to be at that time. But it taught me a lot about myself. And it showed different qualities about myself that I did not know I had that my managers were able to see. And um, it kind of brought out the best of me. Even though I didn't want to be there, I was unhappy going to work every day doing what I did, but I did everything that I could do as well as I could because it was the only choice that I had and there was no other option for me. And um, several years later, after about a year and a half of physical therapy, uh, I wanted to make a move to get back to personal training again. And when I did, I actually, one of the states I wanted to move to was Texas Uh, uh, at the time when I wanted to leave and didn't have a way to get out. But when my managers came to me and they said, we've seen tremendous leadership skills that we didn't know you had, being in a position that I didn't even want. And as a result of showing those skills, I actually got a chance. And they said, we're opening a brand new location in Plano, Texas. And uh, we'd like to know if you would like to transfer and be the senior trainer there. And you'll get to leave Florida. Nice. And (laughs) ending up somewhere where I didn't expect to be and didn't want to be ended up putting me where I am right now, where I've never been happier in the most amazing church I've ever been in in my life. And it's landed me in a place where I now have a relationship with God that I never had before because I just didn't make the time for him, but I still wanted what I wanted. And when I got what I didn't want, God now put me where I am. And it's the only place I've ever wanted to be so Man. bad in my entire life. Love I love every day that I come here. I love it. So praise Jesus. Thank Amen. you for sharing that, Ricky. One, one thing, I appreciate it. One of the things I love about Ricky's story is that if you could hear in what he shared, that through an injury, a, a tragedy that almost killed him, he was demoted in his job, lost his career, went through some personal things. Someday I hope Ricky just shares a whole story with you. But through what was in his eyes and the world's eyes a demotion. God taught him some things to set him up for a promotion. Through our hopeless situations, see, we're not in hopelessness just to be there or because we can't get out. Because the process of learning hope gets us ready for promotion, teaches us, changes us, it helps us, and it helps others. Tonight as we close, Ricky, if you'd help me, you can sit down. I'm going to bring my, my favorite bike back up again and just share a couple more things about it that I think are important. When you ride the bikes on the trails, one of the things you got to have, you got to have the right gear, if we're being honest. I don't ride with anybody without a helmet. Ricky doesn't ride without a helmet. You got to have a helmet. You got to have gloves. I ride with gloves, right? I want, I want the right gloves. You got to have padded shorts, too. I mean, that's, that's probably the. Padded shorts make a big difference. But one of my favorite things I have are the right shoes. Um, And there's several different shoes you can wear, but these are specific shoes. Hey, hey, let me see. Don't take my bike away yet. I want you to hold it for me. Because these shoes require a little bit more. These are what would be called clip-in shoes. And so when you're riding the bike, and you have these shoes on your feet, you clip into that pedal. And I, I didn't start riding this way. And for those of you who are bikers, you know exactly what I'm talking about. For those of you who are not, that looks stupid. That looks crazy. You know what that looks like to me? Commitments. If you're going to clip yourself onto the bike, you better be committed. Because getting off is not as easy. You can do it. But it doesn't happen as fast. And it certainly comes with some danger. But for me, it just means I'm committed. I'm a part of this journey. During my time at church in the dirt, 
I learned what it was to, like to get committed to what God was doing, to get committed to whatever that process looked like. I didn't want to be here at Freedom Church until I chose to commit. God, no matter how ugly it is, how long it takes, I'm going to clip in. I'm, going to, I'm in it for the long haul. I'm going to commit to this process. I'm going to commit to hope. I'm going to commit to change. I'm going to commit to letting the power of God restore me. But I learned some things about riding. Take it now, Ricky. If you're going to ride the mountain bike trails, there's a few things you better do. Number one, know your limits. Know your limits. You certainly have to push yourself, but know your limits. When I first started riding, I, I knew I needed a better bike. When I six times out, I broke that cheap one. Went out and upgraded bikes. And the truth is, every bike I have is way better a bike than I am a rider. But I thought, man... I got this really cool bike. I'm going to take this really big jump, right? This is one of those times my wife was with me. I come around the corner. I hit the jump. And let's just say the bike was a better bike than I was a rider. And I hit the ground and broke two ribs. And I was out for a while. You have to know your limits. It wasn't quite there yet. The other thing you have to do is choose your line. It, it, it depends when you're going through the trees and the roots and the rocks and down certain things, that you choose the right line. You want to choose the path that is best suited for you and your bike and your skill level. Choose your line. Choose your direction. And the third thing I had to do was commit. Clip in. Tonight, I want to just ask you to bow your heads with me, if you would, and Here's what I'm going to do. I'm just going to encourage you tonight. I, I'm going to encourage you tonight to allow God to begin the process in your life. If you slipped your hand up earlier, allow God to begin the process in your life of restoring hope. For some of you, <laughs> you need some church in the dirt. And what that means is you're going through some junk. You're going through some ugliness. You're going through some dirty, hard times. What better time is there? to know God, to learn God, and to love God. Matter of fact, God says he is near to the brokenhearted. Here's what I'm saying tonight. In your situation, have church. Have church. Let God show you some things, teach you some things, restore you. Some of you tonight just need to commit. Just need to be willingness and open letting God change you. I want to do this by a show of hands and the musicians are just going to sing tonight and, and, and close us out with the worship song but I want to just do this before we do. If you're here and you say, Pastor Kelly I need hope. We sang about the living hope but I was honest when I said earlier I'm going through some stuff or maybe some of those things you went through before you're not really through yet and tonight you just need to admit that Jesus Christ is the only way.